Beside the remnants of an ancient forest, these scientists are visiting life from a remote period of our planet's history. They are not cloning dinosaurs, but they are studying animals and plants which lived around 200 million years ago and painting a picture of a world no people before them have ever seen. The fossils protected here are bits and pieces of what life was like during a time we now call Triassic, in a place we now call Petrified Forest National Park. Bill Parker is the vertebrate paleontologist at Petrified Forest National Park. Paleontology is the study of ancient life. Paleontologists study fossils to learn about organisms of the past and to put together the history of life on Earth. Our big questions are, where do we come from, and how are all living things related to each other? To find fossils, we need a few things. We need rocks of the right type, rocks of the right age, rocks from the right ancient environment, and a little bit of luck doesn't hurt either. Petrified Forest is a great place to look for fossils because we have vast exposures of terrestrial rocks from the Late Triassic. The Late Triassic is a very important period in Earth's history because it's when we start to see the beginnings of our modern fauna. We get our first turtles, our first lizards, our first animals that give rise to birds and crocodiles. Petrified Forest is famous for its large deposits of petrified wood, but we have a lot of other fossils here as well, everything from fossil pollen to some of the earliest dinosaurs. In fact, dinosaurs are actually pretty rare in Triassic rocks, especially from North America. And Petrified Forest has some sites where we actually get up to nine individuals of early theropod dinosaurs. This makes the rocks and fossils of this park extremely important scientifically. I've been working here at Petrified Forest for more than a dozen years, and one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is that every time I go out, I find something new. And sometimes, that something new turns out to be something old, such as evidence of earlier scientific work that was done in what is now a national park. Sidney Ash is a paleobotanist who has worked in the park for almost 50 years. Scientific explorations of the southwestern United States began shortly after the end of the Mexican War. One of the most important of these expeditions to the Petrified Forest is the one led by Lieutenant Emil Whipple in 1853. In December of 1853, the expedition found itself on the floor of a large wash on which there were many hundreds of petrified logs. They named this lithodendron wash, in other words, stone trees wash. Also accompanying Whipple was Jules Marcoux, who was well known and respected in Europe. After studying the rocks in the area, he determined that they were probably the same age as rocks called Triassic in Europe and in England. By 1853, there was a general recognition of geologic time, and a geologic time chart was being developed. In 1878, General of the Army's William Tecumseh Sherman was visiting Fort Wingate, New Mexico and he thought it would be useful if several of these logs were uh, collected and sent back to Washington, D.C. Lieutenant John Hedgevald, who was stationed at Fort Wingate, was designated to take a small detail of men, and they camped on the rim of Lithodendron Wash. He talked to some of the Navajo sheep herders living in the area, and they thought it rather strange that uh, the great father in Washington would want any of these stone logs that were laying around. We have discovered what we believe is the site of Hedgewald's camp 
because there is a large spring there and also the ruins of two Navajo Hogans. These stone logs eventually were loaded onto a train and deposited in the Smithsonian. The wood that uh, was collected was studied about 10 years later by the paleobotanist Frank Knowlton. The wood that Dr. Knowlton studied is not colorful like the rainbow wood that's uh, found quite abundantly in the petrified forest. In fact, the uh, rainbow wood does not have much wood structure and is not of much scientific interest. In the dark wood, one can see the cellular structure, can see the rays and so forth, a lot of the microscopic details of the wood. Near the end of the 19th century, the petrified logs attracted a lot of attention and local people in the area surrounding the petrified forest were eventually concerned that all of the wood would be taken away by tourists. And so they petitioned Congress to protect it and the petrified wood. Previously, areas had been set aside that were very scenic, but this was a new concept, the preservation of a scientific resource in 1906, it was set aside as a national monument by President Theodore Roosevelt. John Muir was one of the first people to collect vertebrate fossils from what became the Petrified Forest National Park. The railroad stop down there was at Amana, which is right kind of between the two halves of the park. The train stopped for water. Muir got off and just wandered around looking at things and came back with some phytosaur bone, which he came out west with. Muir's collection was put into what became our Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley, which is a very big college museum, also has the state collection for California in it. Researchers from all over the world make use of the work done at Petrified Forest National Park. But the modern era of scientific studies began with the work of people from the University of California at Berkeley where Kevin Padian is professor of integrative biology. That gets back to about as far as you can for collecting vertebrate bones in the park. From then, Annie Alexander, who was the heiress to a sugar fortune, she was intensely interested in natural history. And she and her friend Louise Kellogg were down in the southwest at the Petrified Forest. And she wrote back to the museum here to Professor Charles Camp who had just been hired. He had just finished his dissertation at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. She wrote him to say, we have vertebrate bone all over the place here. Come down right away. And so Camp did that. He got outfitted, took an old kind of jalopy that had University of California Museum of Paleontology on the side. And this was the beginning of the collections of the petrified forest that were made. And they were housed here. Camp's work continued through the 1920s and 1930s. He was the first person really to understand the stratigraphic relationships of the beds in the park. And he worked this out partly by reference to the kinds of phytosaurs that were found at different levels in the park. He had collected so many phytosaur skeletons and materials from it that he had a really good idea of how he thought the faunas were changing through time in the petrified forest. But some new work in the 1970s of a complex realignment of essentially all these early beginning of the age of dinosaurs horizons around the world realigned some of these things so that some of the stuff we thought previously was Triassic now was moved up into the Jurassic. The difference was really stark in the kinds of animals that were present because in the Triassic, dinosaurs were almost not there at all very, very rare, but we had lots of phytosaurs and ancient crocodile relatives and lots of terrestrial things like that, plus these big flat-headed amphibian guys. I came here to Berkeley in 1980, so it was really kind of exciting for us to go back to these places and explore what was out there to try to get a sense of how the faunas were changing across that Triassic-Jurassic boundary. To understand how animals change with time, Scientists need to know the ages of the rocks 
which contain their fossils. Jeff Martz helped make the latest geologic map of the park and explains why that was so important. The rocks that we find fossils in, including at Petrified Forest National Park, are what are called sedimentary rocks. Behind me you can see a series of sedimentary rocks which have been built up over time and stacked up into a series of strata. Now because these sediments are piling on top of sediments that were already there, we know that the sediments on the lower strata are oldest and the sediments higher up are youngest. And as we go from bottom to top, we go from oldest to youngest. This principle is called the law of superposition, and it's basically the tool that allows us to reconstruct the history of life on Earth. As we look at layers of sedimentary strata around the world and the fossils they contain, we are able to put them in order based on whether they are lower in the sequence or higher in the sequence. In geologic mapping, particular layers of strata are traced throughout a certain area and drawn in on a map. A geologic map allows all researchers working in an area to tie their work into a known timeline. However, that timeline is only as accurate as the stratigraphy on which it is based. Several years ago, when errors were discovered in the geologic map of the park being used at the time, we began to carefully explore the park, following strata on foot and tracing their distribution on topographic maps. This allowed us to construct an extremely accurate geologic map. This changed our understanding of the relative ages of fossils throughout the park. The new stratigraphy and mapping demonstrated that the climate change and faunal change were very abrupt and that they occurred at almost exactly the same time. This suggests that the faunal change may have been caused by the change in climate. And this is an important contribution to understanding the history of life on Earth. Petrified Forest is a special place on about a zillion different levels. The first is it's just stupefyingly beautiful, in my opinion. Secondly, as a geologist, of course, it has excellent exposures. And the thing that's really cool about them is they're in three dimensions. David Fastofsky of the University of Rhode Island is using the rocks of this special place to, among other things, improve the accuracy of the geologic time scale. It's the time interval as well as the sheer exposure itself that's special. So we can actually time the sequence of this river building its floodplain across the landscape. When we first went to Petrified Forest, we were looking for ash layers to find layers that are potentially datable. PFO is actually filled with volcanic material all the way through the park. And so what we look for now, even more than like typical ash layers, is places where we want to know the date. We started looking less for ash layers in the conventional sense, and we started looking more closely for layers that we thought might preserve zircons. And the zircons are where the uranium lead dates are taken from. The techniques that we're using were pioneered in the 80s and early 90s, and these are the most precise dates that have ever been gotten from an ancient river system. David's colleague, Jahan Ramazani, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is doing this state-of-the-art processing. Geochronology is a science that is concerned with age determination of geologic materials. When zircon crystallizes out of molten rock, it traps all the uranium in the magma in its crystal structure. And because uranium is a radioactive element, it's unstable and it decays to lead. So if we can find a way of measuring how much of that original uranium has decayed away, then we can calculate the age of that crystal and put a date on the volcanic ash we separate those microscopic grains of zircon and then we dissolve those crystals in order to extract uranium and lead from them by chemical methods. Then we put that under a microscope and we start picking them one by one for analysis. Having dates from a number of ash beds gives us a time frame to better understand the rates of geologic change involving things like biologic evolution or climate change. Every age re-examines the past with the perspective of its own present. Here at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., where some of the first petrified trees from the park are still on display, scientists study ancient ecosystems as well as ancient animals. Kay Berensmeyer is co-director of the Evolution of Terrestrial Ecosystems program here and has worked often at Petrified Forest. I am a, a paleoecologist. 
And that means that I like to study whole ecosystems of the past rather than just individual organisms. So we developed this project to look at the ecology of the earliest mammals. And eventually that led us to the petrified forest to come and look at the small preserved fossil vertebrates. What paleontologists generally do to recover small vertebrate fossils is to screen wash those sediments and the teeth are caught in the screens. Well, we very quickly discovered that you can't do that with the petrified forest material. There's a lot of salt that is in the sediment and as soon as water hits that salt, fossils explode and, and they're nothing but crumbs. So we scratched our heads and thought, well, maybe if we take out blocks of matrix in plaster or jackets, the way you'd take out a, a larger bone and micro-excavate them in the laboratory, that would be the way to go. And in fact, that's, it's worked out extremely well. We have volunteers here in the museum, and every week uh, something new is uncovered in, in the fossil lab, which is on uh, our public display. Such innovative techniques have made the most of park discoveries, and those discoveries may become even more frequent because additional lands were added to the park in 2011 and 2013. With the recent expansion of Petrified Forest National Park into, to include new lands, we're going to be making tons of new discoveries. Randy Ermis, curator of paleontology at the Natural History Museum of Utah, has authored several papers based on fieldwork at Petrified Forest National Park. The research that I do and that pretty much all paleontologists do here in North America could not be done without public lands and the agencies that are managing those lands. I've always been fascinated by the Triassic period. You had a hothouse world with no polar ice caps and all sorts of weird experimentation going on evolutionarily. And we know that today, climate varies by latitude, and so we're interested in how latitude varied in the past. You see a lot of these earlier reconstructions of this totally swampy, tropical landscape. And while certainly nearby the rivers that may have been the case, we're beginning to understand that it was a much more seasonally influenced ecosystem. Robin Watley of Columbia College in Chicago is working in the park's backcountry. We knew that the park contained a really complete sequence of late Triassic rocks. But we really wanted to go out to some of the youngest sediments, which are in the northern part of the park, the wilderness area. One of the interesting places that we were looking, there, it's a big phytosaur nursery. So you're not finding teeth that are this long, you're finding teeth that are this long from baby phytosaurs, and that was really exciting. There's a great collection of vertebrates that have been found in the park. Some of these are small vertebrates from older sediments, and I'm making comparisons between some of the small teeth and bones that we found with some of these fossils that were found in the southern part of the park. It's a really exciting program here. There are interns every summer doing paleontology and then they have been going on to study paleontology and everybody who comes has access not only to areas of the park where they can look for fossils, but also to the collections. It's a really great place to work. I started working at Petrified Forest in 2003 as an intern for the Resource Management Division. So I had helped to excavate three phytosaur skulls. Michelle Stocker went on to study at the University of Texas at Austin. What I was able to do for my master's thesis was examine those skulls with respect to a bunch of other specimens that had been collected and put them in a broader context of relationships based on characters. And for most of their history of their research, they were classified for species based on just one bone of the skull. So the height of this element, how round this was, how far this stuck out towards the back, these were all features that people had used previously to say exactly what species they had. What I was able to do as part of my master's research was say that it's not just this one element that tells you what animal you have. You have to look at features of the whole skull, or even better, of the entire skeleton, to say what animal you have those new animals that we collected from the park are actually new species. By working at the park, I was able to gain experience in excavations, in prospecting, and just knowing where to find fossils, and then in understanding what those fossils actually were. As a student, paleontologist Brian Small had similar good luck working in the park. We spend our summers just uh, feet on the ground uh, working the park. 
It was towards the end of the 84 season that I was fortunate enough to be working in Chindi Point and uh, picked up a bone off the ground which I had recognized as an ankle bone of a dinosaur. I knew dinosaurs were very rare in the uh, Triassic of the Western U.S. at the time. And we spent that season and a little bit of the next season looking for the rest of that dinosaur. That would be the first known in uh, North America. The local press really picked up on it, which I thought was kind of fun. People in Holbrook, Arizona were really excited about this. But it did catch the eye of the national media, and it did become uh, a bit of a frenzy. They had already nicknamed it Gertie the Dinosaur. I think it was based on an older cartoon. Pictures were popping up all over Holbrook. We couldn't bring vehicles down to the dinosaur. And by coincidence, a, an oil company was moving a helicopter from Texas to California. They uh, offered their services to uh, airlift it off the floor of the Painted Desert. And all this attention at Petrified Forest really fueled that fire. For a student like me, this was uh, a little more than I bargained for. It was uh, in some ways thrilling, other ways I didn't know what to make of it. Petrified Forest does more than just permit other people's research. Unlike most other national parks, it does research of its own, which helps visiting scientists make better use of their more limited time in the park. One of the functions that the fossils coming out of Petrified Forest today serve is to uh, allow us to analyze them with the new and developing technologies that are coming out of this digital revolution. Tim Rowe of the University of Texas at Austin studies the evolution of vertebrate skeletons. We have digital technologies like CAT scanners that were invented as medical diagnostic tools, but we've adapted them for work in paleontology. We've now crossed this corner from only studying the surfaces to studying these animals in all three dimensions. Using computed tomography, we were able to slice through this and take out the endocast and understand not only the size of the brain, but the size of individual parts of the brain, the parts for vision, the parts for olfaction, the parts for balance and decision making and so forth. Here's a tiny fossil jaw that came out of a, an extensive coring operation. It took years and years of coring at the site to find small bones, but they're more complete and they're more informative. And now with the uh, new technologies, we can study them in far greater detail than ever before. And so we can scan jaws like this and from the CT data, expand them. And using a 3D printer, we can print them out in three dimensions. And as a community of scientists, we can learn far more thanks to these replicas than we can from the original specimens. When John Muir first visited Petrified Forest and when Charlie Camp and Annie Alexander were out there more than a century ago, they couldn't possibly have foreseen this world that we've just reached now. But what they did have is a fundamental vision. And that fundamental vision was that science would progress and that by preserving the park and protecting these lands for scientific research, undoubtedly new scientific insights would emerge. Science, it's been said, is a history of corrected mistakes. To study nature as it was in the past, paleontologists have much less evidence than scientists who study living plants and animals. Every bone, every leaf, every track might lead to a new scientific insight. And that evidence is only found in rich collecting areas like petrified forest. Matt Smith prepares fossils found at the park for scientific study and public display. It's key for preparators to have a great understanding of anatomy, of the chemical composition and makeup of rocks, and just a, a real feeling for fossils as individuals and the stories that they can tell us. It's a lot like a crime scene. Something happened there millions of years ago, and it's our job to capture as much of it as we possibly can. One time I was preparing a fossil of a mammal and a baby had lodged in the pelvis during birth and that's what had killed the mother and it when I first pulled away the flecks of stone that covered up the the teeth of that little baby and I realized what happened 
I darn near wanted to cry. I mean, it was, it was just that present and, and real and alive in that moment. It's nice to have a mix of real objects so that people can see something that has been out there. And then some of the more spectacular and dynamic things can be done with cast. And that's the neat thing about the national parks and any museum is that we're a storehouse, a repository for knowledge that's in the public domain in perpetuity. And it's our job to keep it safe so that our grandchildren and others can come and study it and get their perspective. The national parks have always been about protecting special places. Here at Petrified Forest, though, we are protecting not just the place that is here today, but the place that was here millions of years ago. A geologic treasure from the past that will help shape the science of the future. <laughs>